Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke, and we're going to read this morning from Luke chapter 11, verses 37 to 54. Luke chapter 11, verses 37 to 54. When Jesus had, had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus went outside... The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Thanks, Luke. Morning, everyone. So good to sing with you. I think it's the first time I've sung at SNBC since I was a student in 2009. I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> And thank you, Jansen, for sharing um, that Better Road story. I think Jansen just gave me p permission to get the exegesis slightly wrong, so that's good. <laughs> well, in February 2008, a horrible tragedy occurred in England. Dr. Ubani, a medical doctor, gave accidentally the wrong medication to a patient. Um, the patient was called David Gray, and he was suffering with kidney stones. Uh, what the doctor gave was a lethal dose of pain medication, and within, within hours of administering that dose, David Gray, the patient, died. Now, obviously, there would have been a lot of people affected by this horrible tragedy, but for a moment, I want you just to put yourself in the shoes of the doctor. I imagine he was a, a good man, and I have no doubt that he entered into medicine with the best of intentions to help people to, to bring life. But on this particular day, Dr. Ubani brought death instead. Now in today's passage, Jesus warns that something like that could happen for those of us devoting our lives to ministry. So here at SNBC, we're people who are committed to lives of ministry, aren't we? We, we will all end up in different places uh, with different roles, paid, unpaid, but we're, we're essentially a group of people who want to devote ourselves, commit ourselves to a life of ministry. And we're doing that for good reasons, aren't we? We're doing that because we want to bring meaning, we want to bring purpose, we want to bring life, eternal life, not death and lostness. And yet in today's text, Jesus issues this sober warning. People in our position could unintentionally, unwittingly, could bring death, spiritual death. 
So this is a warning that you and I need to hear, need to take very seriously. So I'd like to spend the first part of this sermon just showing you why I'm saying that, why I'm saying that this text is a warning to us that we could bring death. Then I want to spend the rest of the sermon, most of the sermon, looking at the nature of the warning itself. What exactly is Jesus warning us about? And so to do it this way, we're going to do the passage in slightly out of order. Um, The passage you probably would have noticed has six woes, three to the Pharisees and then three to the experts in the law. Uh, The first two woes in each set of three woes uh, are telling these people what they're doing wrong. And then the third woe, Jesus sets out, explains the impact of what they're doing. They're causing death. So I want to start with the impact. I want to start with that third woe each to see how serious this warning is. And then we're going to work backwards and look at those first two woes to see what the nature of the warning is, what it is that we need to be avoiding. So all that to say that if you're someone who likes things to be in order, I'm sorry in advance. So to start with, why am I saying that this text is a warning to people like you and me? Well, open up to Luke 11. Let's have a look at it. And we've got the, the setting right there at the beginning of the text, verse 37. Jesus is being invited to a dinner party at a Pharisee's house. So imagine that scene, dinner party, Jesus, some Pharisees, some experts in the law. And pretty early on in the dinner party, Jesus breaks with conventions of politeness, doesn't he? He unleashes this series of woes. This is not my usual practice when I get invited to someone's house for dinner. (laughs) You can be assured if you invite me over. But that's what Jesus does here, and he does it for very good reason, because the impact of what these people are doing is devastating. Let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at the third woe to each of the groups to see what the impact of their ministry is. We'll start with... uh, The third word of the Pharisees, which comes in verse 44. Have a look at that with me. Woe to you, says Jesus, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. Unmarked graves, says Jesus. That's what you're like, he says to the Pharisees. Under the Old Testament law, if you came into contact with a grave, it was like coming into contact with a corpse. And that rendered you ritually unclean for seven days. So what that meant was seven days of spiritual, ritual defilement, seven days where you could not come into the presence of God. And because of that, grave sites were usually marked very clearly to make sure people didn't accidentally walk over them. So an an unmarked grave was a particularly nasty kind of thing because it's this invisible, unmarked grave which you could walk over unwittingly and then you're defiled, you're made unclean without even realising it. That is the effect that the Pharisees are having on people, says Jesus. They're spreaders of spiritual uncleanness and defilement. They're like death traps, leading people away from God, out of his presence. And it's particularly insidious because no one realises it's happening. The Pharisees don't realise. The people around them don't realise. Just as with an unmarked grave, so too with a Pharisee, People don't realise that they're being defiled until it's too late. So that's the impact of the ministry of the Pharisees. Um, Let's move now to the experts in the law and have a look at the third woe on them. This comes in verse 52. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you've hindered those who were entering. So with the Pharisees, the image was a grave. Now, with the experts in the law, the image is a key, a key which opens a door. The door here is the door to knowledge. What's inside that door? Knowledge that leads to knowing God, knowledge that leads to relationship with God, entering into his kingdom. This is a really important door, right? This is a door that we all want to be going through. And so that's a really important key. This is a key that we all want access to. And what have the experts in the law done? Taken away that key. They've taken it away. So they're not entering through the door and they're stopping others from entering through the door. 
the experts in the law are obstacles to people knowing God. This is absolutely devastating for both groups, isn't it? This is, this is the absolute opposite of what these groups thought they were doing, what they intended to do. Let's just think about these two groups. The Pharisees, they were a reform movement who were passionate about cleaning up Israel, making Israel holy before God. They were so obsessed with the law because they thought that by obeying it, they would be making Israel, making themselves holy before God. So they saw themselves as leading the way, leading by example in making Israel spiritually pure and clean. And so what a devastating assessment from Jesus when he says to them they're actually spreading spiritual defilement and uncleanness. It's the opposite of what they intended, of what they thought they were doing. Experts in the law, how about them? These people were professionals responsible for interpreting teaching scripture, responsible for giving the knowledge that leads to relationship with God, to entering the kingdom. So once again, what a devastating assessment from Jesus. They're actually shutting people out. They're obstacles to people knowing God. It's the opposite of what they thought they were doing, the opposite of what they intended. So that's the impact of these two groups' ministry. But how does all of this relate to us? We are not Pharisees. We are not experts in the law. So why am I saying that this is a warning to us? Well, let's think about why it's here in our Bibles. Why did Luke record this polemic against the Pharisees? It wasn't just so that his readers could have a history lesson, just so his readers would know historically how bad Jesus' foes were at the time. That's not why he wrote it down. What Jesus critiques the Pharisees and the experts in the law for, these are tendencies that plague humankind. These are tendencies that we can easily find in our own hearts. These problems that Jesus identifies, I'm going to look at them in a moment in the woes one and two for each group. These problems were there long before the Pharisees turned up. All through the Old Testament, the the prophets are critiquing Israel for them. And these problems continue to surface long after the Pharisees were around, right up to this very day. So Luke recorded Jesus' critique, not so you and I can join the I think the Pharisees were really bad club, but because the Pharisees and the experts in the law are representative religious people, representative religious leaders. And so Jesus' woes to the Pharisees and experts in the law are warnings to you and me. They're warnings to us, to us Christians today, especially Christian leaders, especially people committing themselves, devoting themselves to Christian ministry. So to the Pharisees who are already well entrenched in these sins, already leading other people to death, these are devastating pronouncements of their doom, these woes. Now to us, followers of Jesus who hopefully are not entrenched in these sins, not already leading others to death, to us they're warnings. They're warnings not to go down that path, not to commit those sins, lest we too cause spiritual death. So when you think about how these woes uh, speak to us today, I want you to imagine in your mind's eye this scene. Imagine a canoeist canoeing down a river. And on the river bank, you've got this person desperately shouting out, Stop! Go back! Turn around! You're going to die! Because the person on the river bank knows that just in a moment there's this crashing, terrible waterfall which will bring certain death. That's kind of how I want us to imagine that these woes spoken to the Pharisees, how they speak a warning to us. Don't go that way. Okay, so now that we've seen that this text is a warning to us, let's hear this warning. Let's hear Jesus' warning. What is Jesus warning us about? We're people who are devoting our lives to ministry. We want to spread spread meaning. We want to spread life. We don't want to spread lostness and death. So what is it that Jesus is warning us about here? Two things. Dangerous preoccupations and dangerous 
preaching. Preoccupations and preaching. Jesus starts by critiquing the Pharisees for having some dangerous preoccupations. And the first one is appearances. The Pharisees have a dangerous preoccupation with external appearances at the expense of a concern for the condition of their heart. Have a look with me at verse 38. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. So Jesus didn't wash. He didn't use the hand sanitizer. He probably didn't even put on the glove. (laughs) Now, of course, the Pharisee is not concerned about COVID safety. The Pharisee is concerned about ritual purity. But COVID hygiene might actually be a good illustration for us to get inside the head of the Pharisee. You know how since COVID, we're all sort of hypersensitized to any kind of germs. If someone turns up and just sneezes all over you now or coughs all over you, it's, it's a bit different to what it used to be 12 months ago. People, there's a social stigma now with that kind of thing. People are thinking, oh, that's so gross. That's so disgusting. And that's probably how the Pharisee was feeling when he saw Jesus not wash before the meal. So, so ritual hand washing, it wasn't an Old Testament law requirement, but it was a well-established tradition, and Jesus just didn't do it. So the Pharisee was probably thinking, that's spiritually gross, that's spiritually disgusting, how can he spread defilement like that? And then Jesus replies, no, you are spiritually gross, you are spiritually disgusting because you are unclean on the inside. Let's have a look at that, verse 39. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? So their preoccupation with washing, their their preoccupation with ritual purity is actually dangerous. Why? Because they're putting all their attention on external appearances at the expense of the internal reality. Jesus takes the example of a cup or a dish. What's the point of cleaning the outside of a cup or a dish if the inside of it is dirty, he says. And so at the same time, what's the point of a person appearing to be pure and godly to the watching world if on the inside their heart is corrupt, full of greed and wickedness? So this preoccupation that they have with appearances is dangerous because appearances are like a mask hiding something. Their outward cleanliness is masking their inner ungodliness. The purity laws that the Pharisees were so diligently following were actually symbols, external signs that were intended to point to an inner reality. Now, if an external client external sign claims something that is purity before God, but the inner reality is the opposite, wickedness, what do we have? We have hypocrisy. And so a preoccupation with externals, with appearances, is very, very dangerous. So what about us and this warning? We don't live under the Old Testament purity laws but we do have public Christian actions, things that we do, things that other people see, and which could be interpreted as signs of devotion to God. Good things like attending church and singing and praying and serving and leading, there's lots of things that we do like that. These are good things, they're very good things, but we need to realise they're things that we could misuse. See, if our preoccupation becomes appearances, if it becomes how we look to others. We could misuse those good things to keep up appearances, to give an impression of godliness. Watch out! The voice of the person on the riverbank calls out to the canoeist. Watch out! Don't go that way. Don't focus on appearances. Focus on your heart. Don't focus on externals. Focus focus on the internal reality. Jesus actually finishes this this woe with some helpful advice. Verse 41, but now for as for you, sorry, but, but now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean to you. I think what Jesus is saying here is if the heart problem is greed, then hand washing's not the solution. 
The solution is a heart that's freed from enslavement to greed. And a very good way to do that is to give your money away. Focus on the heart, not on appearances. So the first dangerous preoccupation is appearances. The second one is legal details. The Pharisees have a dangerous preoccupation with the details of God's law at the expense of a concern for the goal of God's law. Have a look with me at verse 42. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So the Pharisees went to this incredible nth degree to make sure that they were obeying the tithe command, even down to counting out every last herb and giving 10% of that. And Jesus doesn't actually say here that they shouldn't have done that. What he's lamenting is the fact that in their focus on these details, they've lost sight of what the law is there for. What's the tithe law there for? Why was Israel to give 10%? So they can express their love for God. So they can express their love for neighbour. And one of the ways love for neighbour is expressed is in pursuing justice. That's what the law was there for, to help people love God and to seek justice. God's law reflects God's heart, a heart full of love, a heart full of concern for justice. And God's law, when rightly used, helps us, helps his people to share his heart. So the, the Pharisees are misusing it. With the, the Pharisees focus on legal details with their measuring out of their herbs They've lost sight of the purpose of the law. So let's think about what about us and this warning. I'm guessing that none of us get out our Master Foods jars of cumin and paprika and measure out 10% and put it in the plate on the Sunday. But we do still need to be careful of this dangerous preoccupation. Any time that you and I take the, the radical claims of God to pursue justice, to pursue love, and reduce them to a definable, manageable, measurable code of religious behaviour, any time we do that, we're at risk of this dangerous preoccupation. Let's hear the warning to the canoeist drifting downstream. Watch out. Don't go that way. That way lies disaster. But we should make no mistake, this, this is a, a tempting and attractive approach to religion because it's, it's so much easier. <laughs> it's much easier for me to set myself a simple code of religious behaviour that I need to abide by than to throw myself into the open-ended and messy struggle for the plight of refugees or being there for the vulnerable or coming alongside the poor like Jansen talked about earlier. It's so much easier just to set that simple code. But it's not better. It's not the better road. It's a dangerous preoccupation. How do we avoid it? The solution is not to ignore God's commands. We, we still obey God's commands. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone, says Jesus. We do obey God's commands to give and to pray and to, to gather together and all of God's commands to us, but we focus on the goal of those commands. We do those acts with our hearts focused on why we're doing them. And then God's heart for love and for justice will increasingly be our heart too. So the first dangerous preoccupation was appearances. The second one was legal details. The third and last one is a claim. The Pharisees have a dangerous preoccupation with a claim by other people. That's there in verse 43. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Apparently there was a row of seats in the synagogue near the ark, and if you sat in one of those, well, kudos to you. <laughs> Honour to you. Out in the marketplace, there were actually special greetings for important religious people. 
If you read the Talmud, which is a collection of Jewish teachings, it actually describes some of these elaborate greetings that ordinary people were expected to give to religious leaders to honour them. Now, sitting in those seats or receiving those greetings of respect, uh, Jesus doesn't actually say they are in themselves a problem. What's the problem here? The problem is that they love it. That's the problem. The Pharisees love it. They love the prestige, the status, the acclaim of the people. They, they love the veneration, the, the attention, the feeling of being looked, looked up to by others. It's become their preoccupation. It's, it's become the reason they do their ministry. So the problem isn't that they sat in those seats or that they were greeted with respect. The problem was that they were seeking to draw attention to themselves and not to the one they claimed to serve. So how about us with this warning? Here in Australia, we don't live in a society that gives acclaim and prestige to people in gospel ministry. Some countries in the world, it's very different. In the country we lived in, in Southeast Asia for 10, 10 years, being a religious person, being a religious leader, actually gave you status even from people with another religion. I, I remember um, at our Bible college, uh, one of the students gave a very candid answer to the why did you come to Bible college question. She said, I, I looked around in my village and the person with the highest status and who did the least amount of work was the pastor. So I decided to come to Bible college. <laughs> I remember after a six-month home assignment in Australia, um, we returned to our city in Southeast Asia. So I'd, I'd had six months in Australia where being a missionary doesn't actually earn you much credit with the non-Christian world. It actually earns you derision quite often. So after six months of that, we landed in our city, went through the airport, and the guy at the immigration office opened my passport and saw that I had a religious visa. And he bowed his head, and he used a term of utmost respect and said, welcome back, Mr. Pastor. And I took my passport and I said to Anna, it's good to be back where I get the respect I deserve. <laughs> that was tongue in cheek, okay. That was <laughs> So in some parts of the world where some of us might end up serving, uh, even society at large may give you respect for being in ministry. And so this warning will be one that we need to listen to very carefully. Watch out. That way lies danger. Don't get intoxicated on a claim. But we won't get that here in Australia, at least from society at large. Um, but that doesn't mean we're free from this danger, does it? Because we can get it. We might get it from inside the church. Maybe you like the attention that comes when you preach. Maybe you like the respect that comes with being a Bible study leader. Maybe you're getting kudos right now just for being a Bible college student from other Christians that you know, from being a Bible college staff. Watch out, says Jesus. That way lies danger. Watch out. Don't do it for the acclaim. Don't love the prestige or the approval of people. Do it for him. Do it for the love of God. Do it to draw attention to him. So we have two main warnings in this text. Dangerous preoccupations, which, which we've just looked at. And the second one, which we'll look at now, is dangerous preaching. In verse 45, one of the experts in the law, so one of the preachers of the day, jumps in as Jesus is saying woes on the Pharisees. Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. And Jesus says, I haven't started yet. <laughs> and with his woes to the experts in the law, Jesus critiques them for their dangerous preaching, preaching which stops people from having access to knowledge of God. So I, I want to look at what it is that makes their preaching so dangerous. Uh, and there's two things that come out here. The first one is burdening. The experts in the law are burdening people. Verse 46, Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. 
the experts in the law are preaching and they're teaching in such a way as to load people down with burdens. And the word used here for burdens is literally the word for a ship's cargo. So when they preach, you imagine this figure. <laughs> it's like a loading a ship's cargo on top of the people that they're preaching to. It's crushing. They're crushing them. They're spiritually crushing the people they're preaching to. So what exactly are they doing? How, why is it that they're crushing people? I don't think it's simply that they are teaching God's law, t- teaching God's commands. Jesus himself told his disciples to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So it's not simply the fact of passing on God's commands to God's people. It's more the way that they're doing it. There's this piling up of God's commands without helping people to obey them. There's this piling up of the obligations, but not empowering the people to fulfill them. Jesus says they're not lifting a finger to help. Their preaching is condemning preaching. It's not life-giving preaching. And if we just look at all of these woes um, in this text as a, as a package, a, a, a whole picture of the way the Pharisees and experts in the law treated the law, God's law, starts to emerge. See, for them, the way they taught it, the way they lived it out, the law of God, it's a means of gaining something, approval from people or or acceptance by God. It's a means to an end, a means of getting something. Is this the true way to God? No, says Jesus. No, that's not how we come to God. No, that's not what the law is for. So, so Jesus is challenging legalism here. He's rejecting it. He's clearing it out of the way so that we might be able to embrace a better way, the way of grace. So how about us? We are preachers and teachers, right? We're preachers in training, teachers in training. Let's hear this warning. Watch out. That way lies disaster. That kind of preaching leads to death. When we teach and when we preach, let's teach and preach God's commands in that context of grace. Let's help others to know what the commands are there for, to know that when they seek to obey, they do so as people who are already fully forgiven. When we preach God's commands, let's come alongside people, empower them, help them journey with them in that journey of obedience. So that's the first thing that makes the preaching of the experts in the law dangerous, burdening. The second one, the last one, is missing. They are missing God's messages to them. They're missing them. Verse 47, I'm going to read from verse 47. Woe to you, says Jesus, because you build tombs for the prophets and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill, others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Now, Jesus' argument here isn't the simplest of arguments to follow, but I just want to highlight the gist of it here. Israel, he says, Israel's been rejecting God's messengers, the prophets, for generations. And now the Pharisees and the experts in the law, they are rejecting the ultimate messenger, Jesus. They purport to revere God's messengers by by building memorials for the dead prophets, but by missing who Jesus is, by rejecting Jesus and ultimately killing him, we will see later, they show themselves to be the spiritual heirs of the prophet murderers of previous generations. And Jesus says they're going to be held responsible for all of it. So these Pharisees, these experts in the law, despite their high view of Scripture, despite their acts of devotion, despite their commitment to God's law, so distorted is their religion, the way they're using the law, that when God actually speaks to them, when he actually sends Jesus, they miss it. 
they miss God's communications to them. When God speaks, when God sends Jesus, they miss it. May this never be true of us. Okay, I want to finish by practicing what I'm preaching about preaching. So I'm aware that I'm preaching a sermon about not giving dangerous preaching. So I'm aware of the danger here for me. (laughs) I want to make sure this is not dangerous preaching. So in conclusion, I want to frame everything we talked about today with, with, with these closing words. We're people who are devoting our lives to ministry. So we need to take these warnings in this passage very, very seriously. But as we do that, let's make sure that we hear them as loving warnings from the one who is for us, not as angry condemnations from the one who is against us. That's Jesus, the one who is for us, who is lovingly warning us. But in fact, Jesus is so much more than just a loving warning giver. (laughs) Jesus is also the one who empowers us to obey, who empowers us to heed these warnings. In his own life, in his uh, his own example, Jesus shows us the better way, the better road. Think about Jesus and and all the things he's critiquing the Pharisees and experts in the law for here. Jesus, he, he was a leader who was a servant. Jesus, he didn't just obey God's commands. His heart was motivated by love and compassion and justice as he did that obedience to God. Jesus didn't just command sinners from a distance. He came alongside them. He mixed with them. He empowered them to change. Jesus didn't chase after prestige, did he? Didn't chase after other people's approval. He washed the feet of others. He made himself nothing for others. He even died for others. (laughs) And as the one who has died for us, the one who has showered us in grace and given us his spirit, we can seek to obey his commands in that realm, in that realm of grace. When we seek to obey his commands, we're not doing so seeking acceptance by God. We're doing so as people who are already forgiven and who are being empowered to succeed. So tomorrow... If one of these things that's been critiqued surfaces in your heart, the desire for approval, appearances, yearning for acclaim, if one of these things surfaces in your heart and you notice it, if you discover that sin, don't be crushed by that. Don't be overwhelmed by that. Don't be defeated by that. Jesus has dealt with that. And now he lovingly calls out the warning. Watch out. Don't go there. That way lies trouble and death. Stay here with me. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your loving warnings to us. Save us from dangerous preoccupations and dangerous preaching. Work through us in our ministry, not to bring lostness and death, but meaning, purpose, and life through Jesus for many. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as Rachel flagged earlier, this morning I'd like to finish Principles Hour by speaking about a serious and devastating matter, that is abuse and assault. Abuse comes in many forms, but one form in particular, sexual assault and and abuse, is currently filling social media news feeds, news headlines, and so on. It seems like every day at the moment more is being uncovered about the extent and the depths of devastation that sexual assault and abuse have caused in our communities, including in our churches. There have been horrific stories compiled from teenage girls and young women uh, revealing their experiences of rape and abuse at high school, There have been stories of women in government being sexually assaulted and then their experiences being covered up. There's also been stories of people in ministry who've manipulated and abused people, taking advantage of their positions of power and authority and being protected by others instead of being brought to justice. 
It's important for us to realise that we have people in our communities who have experienced abuse and assault. It's likely that there are survivors of abuse in your church. There are survivors of sexual assault and abuse here in our college community. So if you have experienced sexual assault or any form of abuse, you are not alone. These experiences of evil create layers of trauma and hurt that impact individuals and communities for years to come. I am so truly grieved by this reality, and particularly for those in our SMBC family. How might we respond? We recognise that all forms of abuse, including sexual abuse, are evil. God hates these acts. God stands against these acts. We recognise that the most profound hope for people experiencing the devastation of sexual assault is that offered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we, that is, churches, but also other communities like ours here at college, we can play a part in helping survivors in their journey of taking hold of the healing and the hope that is available in the gospel. What can we do? First, an important response that we can make to these evil acts is to listen to the stories of survivors. We must avoid mistake, the, making the mistake of disbelieving them just because we're so shocked about what happened. We can sit with them in their pain. We can weep with them. We can ask them what it is that they might need and we can help them to seek those needs met. In Psalm 34, David writes, The righteous cry out, cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Second thing that we can do is that we can enact the gospel realities of standing with the wounded. We should speak about the justice of God and seek to pursue some of that justice now where we can and where it's appropriate. We saw in the sermon today a profound call from Jesus to be concerned about justice. And here is one area where we can live this out, pursue justice. A third thing that we can do is that we can point survivors to their value as children of God. We can walk with them on their path of healing and restoration, and we can be ad their advocates if they ask us for help. In Micah 6, the prophet writes, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Lastly, we can be sensitive about the impact that any discussion about abuse, including sexual abuse, can have on survivors. Those of us that have not experienced abuse need to realise that any discussion of the subject, if it's done insensitively, can be painful or distressing or even triggering for survivors. So if you've already had an experience like this at college, I'm sorry. We're putting systems in place to raise awareness and increase our sensitivity towards the experience of survivors. But if you have had experiences like this, or if you do in the future, uh, please let us know if you're able. My prayer is that college will be a place where survivors can journey towards healing and restoration, well supported by staff and students. Even as we discuss with one another what I'm saying right now, let's strive to make sure that our conversations are respectful, healthy, purposeful, and, and giving dignity to survivors and honour to God. If you would like to speak to someone about anything I've said today, in addition to reaching out to your existing support networks like Rachel suggested at the start with the text message uh, you might also like to speak with Leonie Menzies. Leonie Menzies is a friend of the college. Uh, she gave the domestic violence awareness sessions in you know, O-Week. Uh, she's a psychologist and she's got a great deal of experience in this area. 
And she's very kindly offered in response to this message I'm giving today to speak to anyone in the college community. So if you'd like to speak to Leonie, you can text her either today or tomorrow and she'll make a time to talk to you. And her number's available on the transcript of what I'm saying, which you can take as you leave Principal's Hour. It's just on the table out in this foyer here. Leonie's also encouraged me to point out that 1800 Respect is a very good specialist service concerning sexual assault and domestic and family violence. And it's good for us all to know that their website contains helpful information concerning how everyone can support survivors. I'd like to finish by praying. Father God, we thank you that you're a good God and we thank you that you care about justice and that you care for the vulnerable. And we thank you for the profound hope that we all have in the gospel, including abuse and assault survivors. And we pray for survivors. We pray that you will be with them, that you will help them on their journey of healing and hope. And we pray for all of us that we would be supportive, that we would foster restorative, gospel-shaped communities. And we pray this for the sake of your holy name. Amen.